Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we review, regurgitate, and refine the last seven days on the Vatican and the global Catholic Church beat. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with more fuss about fiducia over the last month. The dominant Catholic headline all around the world has been wildly contrasting reactions to the Vatican's December 18th document on the blessing of couples in same-sex unions. This week, Pope Francis himself entered the fray. We will explain why what the Pope had to say rather than dialing down the debate may actually have amplified it. Second up this week, we have got a growing distance. That's how one commentator here in Italy has described the state of Catholic-Jewish relations amid growing tensions over Israel's ongoing war against Hamas on the Gaza Strip. This past week, the chief rabbi of Rome described a great disappointment in the Jewish community with the way the Vatican and the Catholic world has responded. We'll explain what he meant and what the significance of it may be. Third up this week, we have an historic verdict. For the first time, a Vatican court has handed down a guilty verdict in a case involving sexual abuse on Vatican territory. We'll try to take that case apart, and we'll explain what the significance of the verdict may be. And then finally, we've got a worrying remembrance of things past. In Turkey, an attack on a Catholic church this past Sunday has revived memories of previous episodes of anti-Christian violence in Turkey and generated new fears about the future. We'll explain all of that. All that and more is on the docket for you this week on Last Week in the Church, so please do not go anywhere. Do not touch that mouse. Do not click away. We will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are, they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. All right, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, January 30th in the still fresh and brand spanking new year of our Lord 2024. Before we dive in, I'd like to say a quick word about last week's show. Several of you posted comments on YouTube or reached out personally to express concern about my health in the wake of last week's broadcast. I just want to briefly explain that there is really nothing to be overly concerned about. 
since my surgery in October 2022, it was a surgery on my esophagus, I have occasionally had issues with blood sugar levels. If I don't stay on top of my diet and my medicine, what will happen is that my blood sugar will spike a little bit, which can make me a little bit disoriented. I kind of have trouble expressing myself. Really, what I should have done, knowing that that was happening during last week's recording, is I should have re-recorded the entire thing. I was frankly too lazy to do that, and I apologize because I needlessly created alarm. And I promise you, I won't do it again. I will say that although this is not how I would have chosen to do it, what this episode really reminded me of is how many friends we actually have. So many of you reached out in various ways to express your concern. I want you to know I was really touched and moved and deeply grateful for all of that. I will do my best, however, in the future not to give you new reasons to be worried. All right, with that, let us dive in. We begin this week with more fuss about fiducia. So, as we mentioned at the top of the show, since December 18th, it seems, there has been very little else in Catholic conversation other than the row, the tussle, the kerfuffle, the contretemps that was unleashed by the declaration from the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith on the blessings of couples in irregular situations, most notably same-sex couples. The document basically said that outside of liturgical contexts and in ways that do not create confusion with the sacrament of marriage, it is appropriate for these blessings to be, for such blessings to be given. You know, there are 1.3 billion Catholics in the world, and frankly, at this point, if you could field a baseball team with the Catholics who have not yet expressed an opinion on this document, I would be a little bit surprised. It seems everybody, and not just individual Catholics, but whole groupings of them, including entire bishops' conferences, and in one case, that is Africa, the bishops of an entire continent have expressed views on this document and its applicability in their context. And this week, the Pope himself threw in his own two cents. The setting for the papal remarks was a plenary meeting, that is a meeting of all the members of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith here in the Vatican. The Pope gave a brief talk. Really, it was just about four or five paragraphs. But at the end, he touched on fiducia supplicans, and basically here's what he had to say. He said, I want to make two things clear. First, he said that the blessings this document envisions do not require moral perfection in order to be administered. That is, you know, somebody who comes forward for a blessing, you do not have to perform some kind of breathalyzer for moral virtue to be sure that they qualify. Speaking as somebody who has occasionally requested a blessing over the course of my life and who is pretty much anything but virtuous, I'm glad we don't administer tests like that because I'm pretty sure if we did, I wouldn't qualify. Anyway, that was point one that the Pope wanted to make clear. The second thing he said is that when these blessings are given, what is being blessed is the couple, not the union. That is, it is the people requesting the blessing, not the relationship that they are in. And that was important enough to Pope Francis that he actually said it twice. Said it is the persons, not the union, that is being blessed. That obviously an attempt to make clear that in administering these blessings, the church is thereby not approving of same-sex relationships. It is instead blessing the people who were involved in those relationships. That was the gist of what the Pope had to say. Now, this has caused widespread reaction, the Pope's comments have, and perhaps in a hyper-polarized, deeply toxic time, it should not be surprising that the Pope's attempt, and I suppose, you know, we have to assume that the attempt here was to sort of calm things down. In fact, has, if anything, probably made the situation even more complex and more acerbic. In a column that I wrote for the correct site on Sunday, I said what the Pope has done has, is to amplify 
the debate because here's how it breaks down. If you are an LGBTQ plus advocate in the Catholic fold, that is, you want to see the church become more tolerant, more accepting of same-sex relationships, the fact that the Pope went out of his way to say, whoa, wait a minute, we are not blessing same-sex relationships, we're blessing the people involved in those relationships, sort of putting an exclamation point on the idea that the church is not revising its moral analysis of the sinfulness of same-sex conduct, that may be, that's probably going to be to you quite disappointing, and it's probably going to temper your enthusiasm. Many LGBTQ plus advocates hailed Fiducia when it came out a month ago as a milestone, a turning point, a watershed in the way the church relates to their community, they may now be less inclined to be quite that enthusiastic about it. Meanwhile, conservative critics of this document are, and we already know this because the early verdict is in, are going to be disappointed and unsatisfied with what the Pope had to say, sort of on two grounds. One, they're going to argue this distinction he's trying to make between blessing the couple but not the union basically is unsustainable. In the immediate wake of the Pope's comments, one influential Italian blog called Corazim, which is actually edited by a former official of the Vatican Press Office, it posted a commentary basically saying the Pope is involved in a shell game, a con. That is, it's impossible to say that we're going to bless a couple but we're not going to bless their relationship. Basically, the argument is, if you're blessing the couple, you're blessing the relationship, that's it. And anything else is just linguistic ledger domain. The other basis upon which many conservative critics of Fiducia were disappointed in what the Pope had to say is that he acted as if the prescriptions in Fiducia Supplicans are still universally in force without acknowledging that he himself has de facto signed off on a number of exceptions, including one for the entire continent of Africa, basically saying that in Africa, this document does not apply. That was the statement put out by SACON. That's the umbrella group of bishops' conferences in Africa. And we know that that statement was worked out in tight consultation with Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, who is the prefect of the Dicastery for the Faith, and with Pope Francis himself. We know this because Cardinal Fridolin Ambongo of the Democratic Republic of Congo, who was the president of SACOM, said that in an interview with the French Catholic blog, and nobody from the Vatican has denied it. Basically, Cardinal Ambongo said the Pope signed off on this. The Pope approved this, and conservatives are disappointed that the Pope did not publicly acknowledge in his remarks to the dicastery that there are actually whole pockets of the world now where he has said that fiducia is essentially a dead letter. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the point is, if the Pope hoped to end the debate over fiducia with these comments, that it obviously did not work because the debate is still very much with us. On the other hand, I would simply note, this is the early 21st century where somebody has to be mad about something every minute of every day because that's just the kind of metaphysical law of the land. And so that's where we are. We will obviously continue to track the fallout from Fiducia on the crux site. All right, second up this week, we've got a growing distance. So Ricardo Desaini, who is 74 years old, he is a medical doctor by training. He's actually a radiologist, has since 2001 been the chief rabbi of Rome. He took over from the legendary chief rabbi, Elio Towaf, who was the chief rabbi of Rome from 1951 to 2001. Think about that. 50 years, half of a century. Towaf, as a young man, had been involved in the Partigiani, the partisan resistance to the Nazis and to the fascists during the Second World War, then became the chief rabbi of Rome. He was the chief rabbi, for instance, who hosted. Pope John Paul II, when he made his historic 1986 visit to the synagogue in Rome, the first time since the Apostolic Age that a pope had entered a Jewish synagogue. On that occasion, John Paul II described Jews as our older brothers in the faith. Anyway, 
Tawaf was just a towering figure, a lion. Desaini has inherited not only Tawaf's job, but in some ways his status as a key point of reference in terms of world Judaism and especially Catholic Jewish relations. And of late, he has been sounding notes of alarm. On January 17th, he spoke at a conference on Catholic Jewish relations at Rome's Jesuit sponsored Gregorian University. And at that time, he warned of what he called many steps backward in Catholic Jewish relations since the October 7th sneak attack by Hamas against Israel and the subsequent Israeli invasion of the Gaza Strip. He complained of what he called a jumble of religious and political statements that have been coming from the Vatican and from other Catholic figures, including the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, Cardinal Pierre Battista Pizzaballa. He objected, for instance, to the fact that Cardinal Pizzaballa, when he made his Christmas visit to Bethlehem, was photographed and videotaped wearing a Palestinian kefa, that's the black and white Palestinian scarf, over his cardinal's garments. It's a scarf that is associated with Palestinian resistance, and it was sort of taken as an indirect, nonverbal, if you like, endorsement of the Palestinian cause in the ongoing war on Gaza. And Riccardi had a number of other complaints in that those remarks at the Gregorian, for instance, He cited the Pope's frequent remark that war is always a defeat for humanity, and basically, Descartes said, sorry, but you're wrong. He said, war is not always a defeat for humanity because sometimes evildoers actually have to be held accountable. They have to be stopped. He said, the defeat of the Nazis in the Second World War was not a defeat for humanity. It was actually a victory for humanity. And then, you know, referring to the Pope's calling a special day of prayer for peace, Desaigne said, look, you don't have a monopoly on peace. We want peace too, but it's a question of what kind of peace and at what price. Now, as I said, that was January 17th. This past week, Riccardi gave an interview to the Italian newspaper Il Giornale, which literally translates as the newspaper. And in that that interview, Desaigne confirmed those remarks that he had made in the 17th, he said there is great disappointment in the Jewish community at the way Pope Francis and other influential Catholic figures have responded to the ongoing war against Hamas. And he said it is critically important that the dialogue get back on track, suggesting, of course, that at the moment it is off track. Now, you know, Desaini is simply one figure, and it should be said that over the years, in terms of Catholic-Jewish relations, sometimes the harshest line in that relationship has been taken by Italian Jews, and especially Roman Jews, understandably, because for centuries they sort of lived under the thumb, right, of papal theocracy. And so they sometimes have a bit of a hair trigger when it comes to this kind of thing. They're not always, therefore, exactly a bellwether of broader Jewish sentiment around the world. Although, in this case, it probably should be said that Desaini's comments, while other Jewish leaders might not perhaps go quite as far, it probably is fair to say that the kind of concern about the line that has been coming from the Vatican is fairly broadly shared among many Jewish organizations and many Jewish leaders. Desaini, as I say, in Italy, he is considered a leading point of reference and a leading sort of moral figure on the Italian landscape. And so this creed de cour that he is issuing undoubtedly will stimulate a sort of new moment and a new impetus in Catholic-Jewish relations. Where things go from here is anyone's guess, but I do predict that whatever happens, Desaini will be a key figure and therefore well worth keeping our eyes on in terms of developments going forward. All right, third end this week, 
we turn not to Catholic Jewish relations, but instead to another source of perennial challenge and in some ways heartburn, which is the clerical sexual abuse scandals. And an historic verdict that was handed down this week by a Vatican appeals court, which amounts essentially to the very first guilty verdict ever handed down by a Vatican tribunal for sexual abuse committed on Vatican territory. It concerns a case that first erupted in 2019 with a book by a well-known Italian journalist, Gianluigi Nuzzi. And if that name seems familiar to you, it should, because Nuzzi was one of two journalists charged in the famous Vatti Leaks case involving documents, I'm talking about the original Vatti Leaks case, involving documents stolen off the desk of then Pope Benedict XVI, which ended up in a book published by Nuzzi. And later, Nuzzi and another Italian journalist were also involved in the second Vatti Leaks case. So Nuzzi has been around the block in terms of Vatican exposés. In 2019, he published a book called Original Sin, which, among other things, included an interview with a Polish former seminarian in a pre-seminary. It was called the Pre-Seminary of St. Pius X, which at the time was located on Vatican grounds. And this Polish ex-seminarian was describing what he characterized as a climate of abuse within the pre-seminary, including charges of abuse against a particular seminarian who later went on to become ordained and is today a priest by the name of Father Gabriele Martinelli. So as a result of Nuzzi's book and the fact that this Polish ex-seminarian gave television interviews and essentially publicized the thing, an investigation was launched which culminated in a Vatican trial in 2021 in which Martinelli, who had been a minor at the time that his alleged abuse occurred, but he was nevertheless a senior seminarian at this pre-seminary, he was accused of abusing another seminarian who was seven months younger than him and junior in the pecking order inside the institution. And the former rector of the seminary, an Italian priest by the name of Enrico Radice, was accused of knowing about it but not doing anything, so he was accused essentially of covering it up. There was a trial, and both of them were acquitted. Martinelli's defense essentially boiled down to whatever sexual acts may have occurred were essentially consensual. And further, he suggested that the victim in this case, who has not been identified publicly, he has been designated in court documents and in news reports only by the initials LG. Martinelli claimed that his accuser was bringing forth these accusations as a result of an internal sort of fight within the pre-seminary. Basically, Martinelli said there was a split in the pre-seminary between what he described as traditionalists and moderates. He said the traditionalists favored the Latin Mass. They were opposed to reforms of the Second Vatican Council. He actually claimed that his accuser was so much a traditionalist that he had once refused to serve a mass that was being celebrated by a visiting bishop because this mass was being celebrated using the post-Vatican II reformed liturgy. And according to Martinelli, what was going on here was really political payback because Martinelli was on the other side of that internal divide. Well, so at trial, that is the trial that took place in 2021, Given the competing versions of events and the fact that both the alleged perpetrator and the alleged victim in the case had been minors at the time, the court basically sort of said, we can't figure out what was going on here. And so both Martinelli and Radice were absolved. That is, they were acquitted. However, 
in the Vatican system of criminal justice, just like in Italy, it's not just the defense that it can appeal a verdict, so can the prosecution. So the prosecution, in this case, appealed. The case went to the appeals court, and the appeals court decided that for some period of time covered by the accusations, Martinelli actually could be held accountable, and they found him guilty. And they have sentenced him to two years and six months in prison. One interesting footnote about all of this is that the lawyer who represented the victim, that is, who represented LG in this case, is an Italian laywoman by the name of Laura Segro. And Segro is best known to Italians as the lawyer who represents the family of Umanuela Orlandi. That is, the 15 year old girl who, Vatican girl, who disappeared in 1983 and whose fate has become the biggest Vatican mystery story of modern times. So, Martinelli, as I say, has been convicted, has been sentenced to prison. Now, he too can appeal to the Vatican's ultimate court, that is, its highest court. We will see if that is going to be the case. But, assuming the conviction stands, he would then take his place with Monsignor Carlo Capella, a former official of the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C., who was convicted of possession of child pornography and who has been serving a five-year prison sentence, basically on house, I guess you would call it work release. He, he has a residence on Vatican grounds, and he works in a gift shop in the Vatican. Capella does. We will see how Martinelli's sentence is, is sort of arranged. In the meantime, this pre-seminary, after that original verdict, the pre-seminary was moved off Vatican grounds, so it's no longer located there. It moved to another, another setting here in Rome. I think the fallout of all of this, this was a very complicated and bizarre sort of case. You know, people will continue to debate the rights and wrongs of it, but I think, you know, at a big picture level, the takeaway is this is yet another demonstration that the Vatican and the Pope Francis era clearly is committed to being serious and to being perceived as serious about prosecution of and accountability for acts of sexual abuse. All right, finally this week, a troubling remembrance of things past in Turkey. So on Sunday, two gunmen wearing, wearing black baklavas stormed into the Catholic Church of St. Mary's in a neighborhood of Istanbul, and they shot dead a man they encountered inside the church and then fled. This man, by the way, was described by relatives as a mentally disabled individual who had been invited to the mass by his family. So it was just sort of random. He was the first guy these gunmen encountered. They shot him, killed him, and then took off. After a brief manhunt, the two perpet alleged perpetrators were arrested by Turkish authorities. They were identified as one was from Tajikistan, the other Russian, both with ties to the Islamic State. The Islamic State took credit for the attack in a communique posted to its Telegram account, ISIS said that this attack had been carried out in keeping with orders from leaders of the Islamic State to target Jews and Christians. And Prime Minister, Turkish President, rather, Recep Erdogan, put in a call to the pastor of St. Mary's Church, basically expressing solidarity and condolences and vowing that all necessary measures to provide security would be taken. Now, Okay, this was one attack on one church, and while tragic, only one person died. But you have to put this in context. For Turkish Christians, this resurrects some very ugly memories. In 2006, a Catholic priest was shot to death by the name of Father Andreas Santoro in Trebzon, Turkey, by a 16-year-old boy shouting Allah Akbar. In 2010, Santoro's former bishop, a Capuchin bishop by the name of Luigi Padovese, was beheaded by his driver, a Muslim who had become radicalized, who was also shouting Allah Akbar at the time this happened. Other Christians 
in Turkey had been beaten, had been attacked. Three other Catholic priests in the wake of the killing of Santoro were attacked. The memory of all of that is very much alive among Turkey's small but symbolically significant Christian population. That population, by the way, had dwindled to about 150,000 under various pressures over recent years, but actually, of late, that population has been boosted because of a significant influx of refugees from both Russia and Ukraine as a result of the ongoing war, the vast majority of whom are Orthodox Christians. And as the Christian population is growing and becoming more visible, there are fears that it also may be at greater risk. And certainly Sunday's attack illustrates that. Pope Francis expressed his own condolences in his remarks during his noontime Sunday Angelus address, saying he wanted to express his closeness to that church in Turkey and his concern. It is a concern that Turkish Christians increasingly are going to feel, and it is one that both the Vatican and Christian leaders around the world are going to have to keep an eye on. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. We will be back here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel, same blood sugar under control, I promise you. In the meantime, please have a fantastic and blessed week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will talk to you again very soon.